Thank you so much. What a great uh, panel to, to join. And um, it's nice to be back at King Alfred's. I think I was last here when I was about 12 on the summer schools that I think are still known as the Highland Games. So it's nice that some things don't change. <laughs> it's a bit of reassurance. Um, I want to pick up where Robert left off. And obviously, we're back in school on a Saturday. We've obviously all done something wrong to get kept in. Um, but we're going we're gonna to solve the education system today. So it's, it's definitely worth it. Um, I wanted to start with, with history as my first lesson. Um, and to, to take, given the, how venerable the King Alfred Society is, to take you back to 1904, shortly after this was founded. Um, and uh, obviously, you'll all remember exactly what happened in 1904 from your excellent history lessons. But I'm not going to come out to you. I'm going to remind you of some of the things that happened in 1904. So um, the first subway line opened in, in New York. Um, Kaiser Wilhelm recorded for the first time a political speech um, on Edison's cylinder. Um, fingerprints were first used as evidence. Uh, and Mr. Gillette patented the razor blade. Um, so fast forward to now. Um, back in 1904 as well, back, back here in London, um, Dr. Robert Morant uh, presented his innovative new curriculum to the Board of Education, uh, to universal approval. Uh, this was the way that he was going to help the, the boys of England uh, to, to, to succeed in this new century. Um, and that contained English and maths, uh, science, a language, history, geography and technical drawing. So here we are, we have uh, phones in our pockets that are opened by our fingerprints. We can call cars to our door. Um, things haven't really moved on in the razor blades. I think we've gone backwards there. <laughs> we now seem to need about four to do what we could do with one. But anyway, that's probably for another day. Um, in the sphere of education, uh, Nick Gibbs' ed uh, English baccalaureate is slightly less broad than Richard Morant's 1904 curriculum because it doesn't contain technical drawing. So, uh, where does that leave us in terms of kind of taking things forward? So, next, next period is economics, uh, and some of our work at the Edge Foundation looks at kind of the, the broader picture. You've heard about parents, pupils, teachers, now thinking about kind of just the broader economic arguments. Pre-pandemic, uh, almost a quarter of vacancies in the UK economy were what we call skill shortage vacancies. So, vacancies that couldn't be filled because the employers couldn't find the skills that they needed. There was a mismatch, there was something not working there to connect the skills and employment. That's a tragedy from a business perspective because those are small businesses that could have grown and, and, could, have, and could have flourished. But more importantly, it's a, it's a tragedy from a social perspective because those were jobs that could have been done by some of the amazing, talented young people, the fish who slipped through Bill's net from earlier this morning. Our colleagues at the Open University do some amazing work each year through their business barometer to measure the cost of that. So another scary number coming, over £6 billion is the cost of those skill shortages. So just that mismatch, that friction in the system is costing us collectively an absolutely massive amount. And by the government's own admission, things are getting worse. So their own Industrial Strategy Council suggested that by 2030, 7 million more workers won't have the skills they need for, their, for the jobs that are changing. So something is going to have to change from Robert Morant's curriculum of the 1904 and the kind of assessment that goes alongside it. I think one of the big tragedies is, and you're going to hear next from uh, an amazing employer, Vanessa, but um, not all employers are in that same space. So one of the challenging things, I think, is that employers have been telling us for decades now what they need to change. Uh, and it's loud and clear from things like the government's own employer perspective survey, from work done by the CBI and the Federation of Small Businesses. So employers tell us overwhelmingly that they want a mixture of academic and technical skills. They don't see this crazy divide that is just you have to choose one or the other. Um, it's absolutely mad then that we're getting rid of things like the BTEC exams and, and similar qualifications and asking young people to take a, a binary decision between being academic or being technical. Um, so allied to this, we've been uh, running a campaign called Protect Student Choice. Go and sign the petition if you, if you uh, agree with me on that point. But the other thing that comes out loudest and clearest, and this, this touches on what Bill was saying earlier about creativity, is that it's those employability skills, those 21st century skills, whatever we call them, that's what employers across the world are calling out for. Um, over 90% in LinkedIn's research internationally, over 75% in the CBI's research here in England. They're looking for creativity, for problem solving, uh, for team working, for communication. And the good news is that those are the same kind of skills that we're going to want in uh, you know, good parents, good neighbours, good members of our community. So it's like a win-win. If we give them the skills that employers are looking for for work, actually we're going to have the family members and community members that we want as well. It's a challenge that everyone needs to step up uh, and address. So I think uh, although I'm kind of uh, advocating for what businesses need in part, um, businesses offered 9 million fewer training days in 2018 than they did in 2011. So it's also part of their role to step forward and, and help to train and support uh, young people and adults to, to retrain. 
But at the very heart of this is the kind of education policy that is meaning that the things that we're going to hear about in the carousel later, that lots of people in this room are involved in, are still the things done by brave people who are willing to stick their neck out. They're not things that are encouraged by the system. Uh, and we want to try and make this uh, the norm rather than the exception. So I wanted to finish with a bit of a positive story and maybe uh, kind of geography as our last period uh, and kind of go a bit internationally uh, where there is some kind of cause for support and a reason why I think it's absolutely right to start with assessment as we try and change the system um, because I think we need to change assessment, pedagogy and curriculum but we have to start somewhere. So I spent some great time um, over in the States with some really forward thinking schools that were starting to change things by changing assessment uh, and they had uh, again as Rachel said not got rid of endpoint exams, they had a role but they were only one part of how they assessed a young person at the end of their school. To graduate, they had to do this amazing kind of uh, performance uh, of uh, an hour uh, at the end of their school where they brought three key artifacts of learning, three projects they were really proud of. Um, but the really cool thing was that they brought those projects and they presented to their friends, their peers, the teachers in their school, their parents and community organisations. And they talked about what they'd done, but then they digested what skills they'd learned from it. And to get the highest marks, they showed how they'd use those skills outside school. So there's one young woman who really sticks in my head because she was so impressive, um, talked about how she'd in English learnt the skills of developing a really strong argument. And then she'd used that to found a charity back in her community where she was helping young Latino women like herself to push back against authority, take no nonsense from the state, be like clear about their arguments. Um, and she was just really passionate. So she got full marks because she'd shown not that she'd just done her English homework, but that she digested the skills and then used it somewhere else in life. And the even better thing about that was that when I talked to the teachers afterwards, they talked uh, to me about how, even though it was only five years since they introduced that, it had had kind of positive ripple effects throughout the school because every teacher and every pupil was looking ahead, not to just fit doing a, a, a written paper in a dusty exam hall, as, as Bill was saying earlier, but to getting ready for that passage presentation. So every lesson was them, was them thinking about how do I help to give my students that, that, that work to show off? How do I give them the skills to, to, to do that? So I offer you that as a, a really positive example of how quick, uh, you know, it's been, it's been a long time since 1904, but actually how quick things can change um, if we start to use assessment as the, as the basis. So I just leave you with the thought that, you know, in 1904, we were trying to create perhaps a new generation of white male colonial administrators. <laughs> now we're trying to help the amazing diverse young people who were speaking earlier to become web developers and uh, screenplay writers and, and fulfill their dreams. We definitely don't need what we had in 1904. Thank you.